So if everybody's ready, I will go live and we'll let all the attendees in. Wonderful. And I will start at 12. Which is now, you can start. Okay, so we'll go live in three, two, one. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our department's citywide psychiatry grand rounds. I am Shaheen Dharani, Director of Faculty Development for our Department of Psychiatry at the University of Toronto. Thank you so much for joining us today. Prior to the start of our session, I would like to begin with a land acknowledgement. Before I read it, please take a moment to situate yourself and think about the land under and around you. We recognize that many Indigenous nations have long-standing relationships with the territories upon which the sites of the Department of Psychiatry are located that precede the establishment of the University of Toronto. We acknowledge our presence on the traditional territory of many Indigenous nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabek, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. Today, this land is home to many First Nations, Inuit, Métis peoples, and we're grateful to have the opportunity to live, work, and gather on these territories. We acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13, signed by the Mississaugas of the Credit, and the Williams Treaty, signed with multiple Mississaugas and Chippewa bands. Since this event is a virtual gathering, a singular land acknowledgement does not capture the richness of our distribution across many locations. There are few places on earth that someone before us has not called home. I would also like to acknowledge that today, September 30th, marks our National Day for Truth and Reconciliation. Today honors the lost children and survivors of residential schools, their families, and communities. Public commemoration of the painful history and ongoing impacts of residential schools is a vital component of the reconciliation process. On this National Day, I hope we can all engage in opportunities to learn, heal, and take meaningful action to raise awareness of this very tragic legacy of residential schools and honor the thousands of survivors. Resources to assist you with this have been put in the chat. We are delighted today to have Dr. Lisa Dixon, Professor of Psychiatry at Columbia University an internationally recognized health services researcher present our department's Paul Garfinkel Distinguished Scholar Lecture on the topic of meeting the challenges of scaling evidence-based practices. Today's lecture is one of four named lectureships in our department honoring distinguished faculty. Dr. Paul Garfinkel, as we all know, had a renowned career serving as a former chair of our department and president and CEO of the Center for Addiction and Mental Health. We are delighted to have Dr. Garfinkel join us today to say a few words at the close of Dr. Dixon's talk prior to moving into the Q&A. Please feel free to share your questions for Dr. Dixon during her talk in the Q&A box. In support of continuously improving the quality of our citywide grand rounds, please complete the online evaluation that will be sent to you by a link from Eventbrite shortly after today's talk. Your feedback is very much appreciated so we know what went well and how we can improve to better meet your needs. And before I close, please save the date for our next citywide psychiatry rounds hosted by our hospital partner, Sunnybrook Health Sciences Center on Friday, October 28th, where doctors Peggy Richter and Neil Rector will be talking about integrated biological and psychological approaches to OCD. We hope to see you there next month. So at this point, I would like to turn it over to and introduce Dr. Benoit Masson, the Labatt Family Chair of our Department of Psychiatry 
to give a few remarks and to introduce our speaker. Thank you, uh, Dr. Durandi. Uh, I want to echo your welcome to all the attendees from across the city and also your word about the importance of uh, Orange Shirt Day from led by uh, Indigenous and First Nation and National Days for Truth and Reconciliation, which is a federal initiative. So today we are actually doing both. And it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Lisa Dixon, who, uh, as you heard, is a physician and a master in public health and is the Edna L. Edison Professor of Psychiatry at the Columbia University Vagelos College of Physician and Surgeon and at the New York Presbyterian Hospital. She directs the Division of Behavioral Health Services and Policy Research within the Department of Psychiatry. She's an internationally recognized health service researcher with over 25 years of continuous funding from the National Institute of Mental Health and the US Veteran Administration. She oversees activity for the New York State Office of Mental Health in implementing evidence-based practices for persons diagnosed with severe mental illness. Dr. Dixon grants are focused on improving the quality of care for individuals with severe mental disorder. Her work has joined individual engaged in self-help, outpatient psychiatric care, clinician and policymaker in collaborative research endeavor. Welcome, uh, Dr. Dixon. Uh, thank you so much. I'm so delighted to be here. And um, I confess I'm, I'm a little nervous. You know, we, we here in New York um, really admire the uh, mental health system uh, of your country. And, um, uh, you know, as a, as a journal editor, I, I get a number of articles that um, always um, make me take a second look and make sure, you know, uh, because it's so impressive. Um, and to be here on, on this day of truth and reckoning is, is also um, very special to me. And um, I hope that, that what I have to share with you today uh, will be helpful in moving things forward. Um, so I am going to share my screen and, um, okay. So um, I have this amazing job in, in New York state um, and it has allowed me to sort of try to tackle this problem of meeting the challenge of scaling evidence-based practices. Um, okay. So just in terms of disclosures, I do have um, several NIMH grants at this point, mostly studying early psychosis care. And I'm a member of the board of directors of the National Alliance on Mental Illness, which is a family and participant advocacy organization in the United States. But really my most um, important disclosure is, is to be found in this photograph. Um, this is a, a rather old photograph um, of my family. Um, there are six kids in my family and, and I'm this, the one here with the little blue uh, blue tights and very chap lips. Um, and I show this picture because um, the most, probably the most important and transformative experience of my life relative to my profession is the, um, is the fact that one of my brothers um, uh, developed schizophrenia uh, when he was actually in medical school and got thrown out of school um, and uh, ended up uh, taking, uh, uh, police were called, uh, and going by ambulance uh, to the hospital. Um, he, he's been very unlucky and um, remains uh, uh, chronically hospitalized in a New York State hospital. So in many ways, my work in New York is, is a way to, to uh, pay the debt that my family has uh, to the system, which has actually, you know, e even though he's, he's not done particularly well, he's, he's had very humane and, uh, and kind care. So when, when I encounter a challenge or a problem, um, or when I feel like things aren't going well um, uh, and, and the work is too hard, I, I think about my brother and, and what he's uh, had to deal with. And, and I realize how, how um, you know, we have to persevere. Um, so in terms of my learning objectives, 
I'm going to be talking about um, the role of intermediary organizations in scaling evidence based practices and talking some about the tools and strategies uh, that it can be used and then focusing a bit on the, the notion of how fidelity to treatment models uh, facilitates uh, the scaling of evidence based practices and frankly the identification of when you're doing something right and when you're doing something wrong. So the latest research shows that we really should do something with all this research. Uh -huh. um, it's, uh, this is an old cartoon and it, it still regrettably uh, is relevant. Um, and this is another cartoon that, that I just always loved when I trained in a very psychoanalytically oriented program. Um, I utilized the best from Freud, the best from Jung, and the best from my uncle Marty, a very smart fellow. And, and, and this, this cartoon, uh, actually captures a lot of what I think actually does go on uh, in our field. Um, and so I have my, my, fake, um, uh, my, my fake poll here. Uh, we can pretend that we're doing that together. Who or what is the best guide for practice? Previous research, Freud and Jung, or Uncle Marty? And here, this is again, my imagined uh, response to that question. This is completely made up. So uh, don't, don't, please don't think that this comes from your audience. So. Next question, how long is the research to practice gap? One year, five years, 17 years, or this question implies that research makes it to practice. It doesn't. And, and in some ways I, I vacillated back and forth uh, you know, over, over the years in um, kind of whether I think the fourth item is, is actually the truth of it. Um, and, but in, in fact, I mean, in, it, it, there's, this is a sort of a famous uh, diagram article that, um, that sort of puts forward uh, this review that, that it's sort of a 17 year odyssey uh, from uh, research to practice. And I actually um, would say that, that it doesn't always make it to practice. Um, and actually sometimes it's faster than 17 years, but, but the idea here is that, that um, you know, while I, I, I do think, you know, we, we all, and I mean, we really globally, um, have uh, you know have have we've done some good research? I mean, we 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 have a long way to go uh, in research and establishing the causes, establishing treatments. But what what we really lacked, um, and certainly in the United States, I think uh, even more so than Canada, is a way to take that that good uh, research uh, on treatment and systems and 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 make that the benefits of that uh, research available uh, to to people experiencing mental illness. So. Can we get there? Um, you know, when I say there, I mean implementing uh, best practices. Um, and this is where implementation science as a field is, is really focused. And and I have to say that um, I, you know, I, I still encounter a lot of people, excuse me, who are very skeptical um, of implementation science. And 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 I've I've shared my own skepticism. Um, uh, you know, is it a real science? Um, and, and I would just put forward that, that it is. Um, and um, it's very useful and helpful. And what is it? It's the study of methods and strategies to promote the uptake of effective interventions into routine practice to improve the health of a population. So that's what we've been talking about. It is beyond quality improvement. It aims to produce generalizable knowledge that would be applicable across different systems. Um, it relies on the use of theories, models, and frameworks to guide answers to questions about how to make change. Um, and it, it, it will kind of one of the tools or one of the phenomena um, uh, that, that has been sort of uh, defined, characterized, and developed to, to, to support uh, the, the, excuse me, the dissemination of evidence-based practices um, are the so-called intermediary and purveyor organizations. So um, what are they? Um, a purveyor organization is an individual or a group of individuals representing a practice that work to implement a model program with fidelity and good effect. And a purveyor organization typically is focused on one specific evidence-based practice, whereas an intermediary organization um, focuses on multiple evidence-based practices. But, but the idea is that there are these kind of go, they, have an, they sit between say, um, uh, agencies or providers or clinics and say a payer or a government to help that entity um, uh, support the system in delivering high quality care. So this is where this wonderful role that I have in New York comes in. 
Um, and that's, uh, I, I direct something called the Center for Practice Innovations. And what CPI does, it supports New York State's mission to promote the widespread availability of evidence-based practices to do the things that we've talked about and promote recovery-oriented outcomes. And we serve as a key resource to the Office of Mental Health, which is New York State's mental health authority, um, uh, uh, by spreading those practices identified by the Office of Mental Health as critical to accomplish OMH's system transformation initiatives. And, and I'm sure you're aware that, you know, if you look at the map, I mean, New York State is, is a fairly big state. It's got, I mean, it's got, you know, the downstate New York City area, but it's also got uh, a lot of geographic and um, kind of uh, ethnic diversity. So we, we, you know, we have to think across the state, we have to think scalable. Okay. Okay. So here's our website, um, and and this slide shows you um, that we're in fact an intermediary organization, not a purveyor organization. So intermediary organization supports a number of different practices, and you can see here across time. This started in 2008 uh, with the focus on integrated treatment um, initiative. And, and this was um, uh, the brainchild of, of, uh, uh, um, of Susan Essick, uh, Mike Hogan and others who had this vision and understood the importance of combining substance use and uh, mental illness treatment and um, created, I, we'll get to what, what was created initially, but what you can see here is that over time, um, more and more different types of challenges, initiatives, um, practices have been added to uh, our um, portfolio. And, and that it's nice because you get, um, you get uh, synergies. Okay, so this is just again to show you org chart um, and you can see that, um, let's see if this, I'll get this, yeah. Um, you know, again, and you know, in my work and world, you know, all the, 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 the realities of government, of pay, payers, all of that matters. You know? And so you end up a little bit in the weeds, but, but the, the conceptual point I want you to make is not that it matters that it's NYSPI, RFMH, OMH, but that who sits, you know, who's got the ultimate authority and responsibility matters. And that's what you'd have to, in, in your you know, uh, organization or in somebody else's state or country, you have to sort of figure out who that is. And so um, we have, um, uh, different initiatives, as you can see, and then we have sort of units that are cross-cutting that, that um, provide us with our methods. So online assistance unit, we're very digital, we create modules, we provide continuing education, we have data, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, you know, we're, we, we were, we were, we're, much, we're much bigger than we used to be. So this has grown. Um, this has definitely grown, as I, as I hope we have been meeting the needs of the state. Um, just on the horizon, as we continue to grow, uh, we're, we are actually about to add a care management institute. Um, and, and so you might say, well, Lisa, what evidence-based practices are you going to be supporting? And, 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 and I think it, it, I want to sort of reflect the fact that certain um, interventions or approaches have a deeper evidence base than others. And that's part of our job is to try to sort of sort through that and figure that out and essentially advise the state, um, which you know, is the ultimate decision maker in terms of you know, what we think we should focus on. Um, the, a very important part of the organization of this kind of entity, like Center for Practice Innovation, is to have your stakeholders at the table, right? Um, and in, in our case, the mental health providers and agencies are, are key stakeholders. So I just wanted to show you this slide to, so that you could see we have a, a, a pretty um, active and lively uh, provider advisory committee that is made up of participants, uh, 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 agencies and entities all over the state. Okay. And okay, so, so you, know, you can say, Lisa, all right, well, how do you do this? Right. And, and I, I arrived at CPI about 10 years ago now in 2012. And I talked to the leaders of each of the initiatives. I said, what, you know, what do you do? What, you know, what is your approach? And, and, I, and I have to say, I was impressed by the fact that there wasn't a lot of cohesion and coherence. And so what we decided to do was that we, you know, 
and, and this was sort of at the beginnings of implementation science, making it out into sort of mainstream uh, mental health services research. And we, we decided that we needed to come up with sort of a common framework and approach. And so we took this wonderful pa paper by Dam Schroeder and colleagues in implementation science, and they sort of looked at all the implementation research and tried to sort of organize and summarize the different domains, if you will, uh, of the work, how to organize, how, you know, what are the important factors? And they, they group these factors into five categories, characteristics of the intervention, inner setting, outer setting, individuals involved, and implementation processes. And what I, what, uh, what I want you to see here is that for the work that we were doing, and, and you know, again, we had been doing it, um, well, my colleagues had been doing it for, for about three or four years at this point, the notion of the inner setting and the outer setting made the most sense. So the inner setting being in some sense within the agency, within the organization, and the outer settings, um, sort of the, um, the interface between the agency organization and the, and the payer slash government. And so we said, all right, we're going to sort of build that this is gonna be an important part of how we organize and structure and understand the work. But it wasn't completely, like it didn't capture everything. So we kept looking and then we found um, Amy Kilburn's wonderful paper uh, in which she presented the re replicating effective programs framework. And here you see that this is kind of gives you this notion of a longitudinal, you know, um, journey to implement evidence based practices. So we start out with preconditions, we have pre implementation, we have implementation, and we have maintenance and evolution. So this notion that the work that we're doing has has a narrative across time. And so then what we did was we put it all together. Okay, so so we have the outer setting policy, which we sort of shortened to policies, regulations, and fiscal reimbursements to programs must align to support the change. State authorities must provide a clear message of importance to programs. These are the, the sort of the keys for us. And then how does that sort of map to pre-implementation, implementation, and maintenance and evolution? And, and the details here are not as important as I want you to see the picture, all right? And you know the 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 if anybody's interested in 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 the details, the slides you know will be available. But we did that for the for the outer setting, and here our key outer setting approaches were to work with the Office of Mental Health, or you know again in, in our case it was OMH to develop clear expectations, to develop incentives, to embed expectations into program structure. So you know again just think about it. The idea where, you know where we started was you're going to change practice by training clinicians how to do it. You have to do that, but you got to do a whole lot of other things too. So uh, these were some of our key outer setting approaches. And then you see here the inner setting, okay? So we, we took the inner setting and again, pre-implementation, implementation, maintenance and evolution. And I would say here in the inner setting and implementation, I think, we see what we're most familiar with, you know, training, providing technical assistance. Um, but, but again, the point is that, and, and this is really, really challenging and important, but it will be insufficient um, without um, attention to the, you know, pre-implementation and maintenance and evolution phases, as well as everything that is needed uh, to, to, be, to address in the outer setting. So what are our key um, uh, uh, inner setting trainings and implementation supports? We, we rely on, to show a little bit of this, um, on a web-based learning management system that hosts interactive electronic learning modules, webinars, resource libraries. We also do some face-to-face -face training. Um, we do fa some face-to-face -face cons uh, consultations and coaching. And then we do regional and statewide uh, learning collaboratives. And obviously, you know, in the last two years, it's been a lot online, uh, much less face to face. Although we are, you know, there is there is a, it is very important to do, in my view, in my experience, to do some face to face. So, you know, another thing that happened when I arrived um, in New York from Maryland uh, was I, I had really was unfamiliar with this notion of learning collaboratives. And when I uh, pulled the my uh, my new colleagues. 
everybody had a different definition of. So you know, I thought it was actually useful. I, th I think it would be useful to, to to just sort of review this concept briefly, and 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 you know, what do we know about how effective it is or not? Um, so learning collaboratives are um, a kind of a form of learning collaborative uh, learning colla uh, laboratory, um, and and it was originated with the I the Institute for for Health Improvement um, series. You have a situation where kind of multi-stakeholder teams work together over a period of time to test, share, and implement evidence-based strategies. And I think that, um, uh, again, the idea here is that, um, like, let's say 10 agencies or something, or representatives from 10 agencies that are trying to implement early psychosis programs, or trying to implement assertive community treatment programs, or trying to implement individual placement and support, supported employment. Um, uh, connect together, say once a month, um, where with a, a, an a priori agreement to collect data, to focus on a particular set of tasks or tasks, and um, the meetings themselves can become our, our information exchange, problem solving, but the idea is it's done together. And people learn from each other as well as, you know, there's leadership, but leadership isn't, isn't where all the expertise resides. <laughs> Um, a lot of the expertise resides with, with the participants uh, as people learn together. Um, is there evidence that these work? Um, there's an emerging database. Um, uh, this, was, this is actually a slightly older uh, a review. I think it, we could probably do with another review, but um, at that point, mostly pre-post designs of 10 that study providers all found improvements in care processes or uptake of new practices. Of 11 that reported on patient outcomes, all find some all found some benefit, uh, and six of eight studying sustainability found support. So, I mean, this is really an emerging uh, a scientific area um, uh, that that I think um, you know will will has grown and and will continue to grow. Um, another question that you might ask is is whether online learning is effective. And I just again I thought I would sort of dig into that just a little bit here. And, and of course, the question is compared to what, right? Compared to no training, it's pretty clear that internet-based strategies are superior with robust effect sizes. Um, compared to another training strategy, say in-person training, the effect sizes vary, but internet training is at least as good, if not better, with small effect sizes. And, and in our case, again, with our um, really need to scale up across a state that, um, has a lot of, um, you know, is, is, I mean, it's not, it's not as big as Canada, but, you know, you, you can't just drive to the other side of the state, um, in, you know, in a day. The key issue is that non-internet approaches may take more staff training time and may be difficult, if not impossible, to scale up. Um, so are some types of inter internet based training better than others while well, evidence is rot not rock solid? So this is what I'm talking about, like if you have, say, a module or a program what makes it more effective? So you're, you're in the internet world. Um, you're, not, you're not comparing the internet here to in person, but you're comparing one type of internet-based training to another. Um, and, and again, this is, there's a, you know, a fairly robust evidence base now that interactivity, engagement, practice exercises, repetition, and feedback um, uh, are valuable. And, and again, you know, this is kind of where it gets fun, like what works better? For whom? So in, in CPI, the Center for Practice Innovations, this is just to give you a sense of what our um, learning our learning um, management system, which is what houses um, all our electronic learning modules, what 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 we have, what are our topics? And the topics um, you know, pretty well correspond to the evidence-based practices that we're supporting, but there's some that are more general. Um, uh, like um, on, you know, particular, say, psychotherapy modalities, um, uh, core competencies, which are really across all the different um, uh, uh, evidence-based practices. And, and then the other thing I wanted you to see here is, is there's, again, an emerging um, diversity of types of electronic learning modules as, again, the, um, as we change, you know, we're, or as, a, as a society, you know, we like things to be shorter, more to the point, um, engaging as opposed to when we were first making these in 2008, 
you know, these were 45 minute to hour long modules. And, and not, I'm not saying there isn't a place for that, but, but you know, what we are used to seeing online um, has changed. And so our, our, in some ways, how we present that to our learners has to change as well. And the, there's a whole industry, okay? Um, so as I'm saying, how have our modules changed? You know, can expand the audience, shorter micro learning, emphasis on interactivity, um, and then we've also begun to package these into curricula. So you can see here some screenshots of some of our, um, our modules. And, and I should say, it's not just all this, it's also what your budget is, okay? Because if you have $100,000, you can do you know, something a little bit more elaborate, more um, exciting than if you have $5,000. And we, and, we, and we have both of those polls. Um, and we, we work with instructional design companies uh, to make these. So you can see that there's a, you know, a little bit of diversity. We do animations. Uh, this is micro learning. Um, this is actually for assertive community treatment. Um, and then here's an animation, which I, I don't have time to show you. It's on our website, but this, this actually won, uh, won an award. There's again, in, in this whole um, uh, uh, micro uh, online learning industry, it, it's actually really very, very moving. Um, and this is on, on our website, so it's forward-facing and it's really for the community. Um, again, just getting into some of the business of this, when you're trying to implement an evidence-based practice um, and it's your job to do that and you're offering training activities, you wanna be able to track who's doing what, right? So, uh, uh, because if a team, for example, or a program isn't, isn't implementing properly, you, you, you know, you'd like to know if any of the folks in that agency participated in any of your learning activities. So you have to have a way of monitoring and tracking. And, and that's what we do within our learning management system, but you need, a, you know, it costs money and you need a login to get there. Whereas some of our material is what, what we call front facing or forward facing and is for the community. But we won't be able to get the data, say, on, in, on materials that we have that are forward facing. And this is just, to show you that you know over time um, we've had close to 600,000 modules completed uh, by 55,000 uh, people. Um, how do we get people? And, and I, when I say we, again, think of think of of the we as an intermediary organization here. Okay, it could be it, it could be an intermediary organization, you know, in Toronto or you know in California or. Uh, in Maryland, where I where I was for almost 25 years, uh, we also had uh, a, an intermediary organization that supported practices. So, so, so um, here we list some of the incentives, okay, or strategies. So we have some financial incentives, which again span the outer setting and the inner setting. So paying providers, the state actually pays providers to participate in a, in, a, in an annually. Um, designated quality improvement uh, project. Um, uh, for certification, the ACT teams in, in our state are, are required uh, to, to participate in certain, certain trainings. And then we also have non-financial incentives. Um, and again, you can see um, performance profiling, publicizing performance. So performance profiling, the team itself or the program would see how it's doing relative to other agencies or programs but it's private, but then the state can make that public. And that's what happens, uh, at least for some of the activities that, that are, um, are part of, of our program. Um, and you can also motivate people individually. You get you know, CEUs, certificates. It, it's amazing how if you, if you create something that you know, one, can, one can have an evidence of having accomplished something or achieved something, people like that. Pro, uh, you know, clinicians like that. And so that's actually been a fairly effective uh, method. Okay, so I wanted to, in, in the, the, the second half of my talk or the, the last third of my talk, um, just show you two examples of initiatives and how this really works. Um, so individual placement and support is supported employment and education. It's a program developed by Bob Drake and Debbie Becker uh, that focuses on um, competitive employment and degree granting uh, school programs. Um, 
it's very much a um, you know not uh, the opposite or the antithesis of a train in place uh, model as opposed to a place and train model that you know the the idea is that people just go right into jobs there's no job readiness there's no job programs there's no job groups before we you know figure out what we want to do it's just work is the best preparation for work okay um and so the state has funded um uh an ips worker at, uh, within our rehab programs according to a, 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 a the uh, fte according to the number of participants in the pros in what are the so-called pros programs um and um at the moment we're working with 49 pros programs and 35 clinics it turns out that the state has decided to almost double the amount of money they're putting into supported employment. So we're about to double the work that we're about to be doing that we do within this initiative. So we have learning collaboratives that include a number of training and implementation supports. We have online modules, webinars, online meetings, online workshops, remote technical assistance. And I think the key here, um, I, I, just something that we learned as we were as we were um, uh, doing this and that really sort of uh, speaks to this issue of, of um, the, the process being longitudinal. We have some programs that are really good at it. They've learned it, they've been with us for years. They don't need the same kind of support that the programs that are newly involved with this need. And so we have sort of two sets of learning collaboratives, sort of one set for the newbies and others for the established programs. But then at an established program, what happens if someone leaves or the person who's been doing it moves on and suddenly there's a new um and th there's a new team you know maybe one or two new uh, providers they may have to go back to uh, the newbie set of learning collaboratives because they don't have the kind of experience and expertise um uh, that their people who you know whose job whose place they were taking had so so there has to be a certain amount of flexibility but this was like it sounds so obvious, but it was really an incredible breakthrough <laughs> to to be able to have sort of um, uh, a set of learning two two different tracks of learning collaboratives that really matched where the programs were in their implementation um, of the the practice. And this in in this initiative, the the programs do um, self ratings of fidelity. And um, we actually studied whether we whether the um, the self ratings in the context of these learning collaboratives, um, you know, whether the self ratings were reasonably correlated with independent ratings, and we found that they were. Now, I'm not saying that self ratings of fidelity, you know, are are always adequate, um, but again, in the context of the this the relationship between our team and the programs, where where there was a lot of knowledge and shared experience, the self ratings of fidelity have worked extremely well. We're also doing a pilot to introduce um, supported employment to assertive community treatment teams. And again, one of the, the nice advantages of having this intermediary organization where we have two, you know, the, the two different evidence based practices being supported is that there's a sharing and a connecting. So we'll see maybe IPS will work within assertive community treatment, maybe it won't. But um, you know, we're, we're, we're going to find out uh, uh, soon enough. Um, so yeah, <laughs> which outcome would patients most value? Um, medication adherence, reduce their Hamilton score by two points, a competitive job. I would put forward that, um, that a competitive job is, is uh, you know, would, would, would uh, uh, be the, 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 the most likely choice here. Um, and what you see here, um, and this is what we do for each initiative, again, sort of uh, in, in accordance with our um, with our conceptual framework, we say, okay, we have the outer setting, policies, regulations, and fiscal reimbursements, and we have pre-implementation, implementation, maintenance, and evolution. And I've explained to you some of what we do around the implementation piece and the maintenance and evolution piece with our uh, learning collaboratives, but it, it goes much deeper than this. And again, the point here is not for you to see the details, but for you to understand that if you're gonna do this right, you have to think at these levels and the same, uh, the same with the inner setting. Again, use of learning collaboratives, 
Um, and, um, you know, there is, again, sort of a longitudinal uh, pathway here. So just, again, a, a key part of learning collaboratives, a key part of all of our initiatives is data collection. And each month, the programs submit data on the uh, rates of employment for individuals who are um, receiving the IPS services. And again, the data here um, show that, you know, if, if the, the gold standard for uh, employment with IPS services is somewhere around 40 to 50 percent, our programs are, um, are uh, meeting, if not exceeding, uh, those, uh, those uh, uh, outcomes. Um, Okay, and, and again, I, I wanted to show you, and these, these are the, this is the banner for two papers and two academic papers. Um, and and th we're, this, the, the state does not fund the Center for Practice Innovations to, um, to write papers, okay? <laughs> um, you know, we, we are quintessentially, you know, essentially a service entity, but I believe that the if you structure your 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 um, intermediary organization properly, it naturally generates knowledge and data and scholarship. Um, and so these are just a couple of papers um, uh, that we've uh, published. Um, I think um, uh, this this slide shows you the the fidelity scores. Uh, we did have to adjust the the uh, fidelity scores for the pandemic. And you can see here that, I mean, we're not perfect here. The, the programs still have work to do in terms of getting to the point of good fidelity. But, but the idea is that by doing these fidelity scales, we can then understand what programs need help with. And, and this is an example of um, uh, uh, one item that's a part of uh, individual placement support is, is disclosure. Um, and this is where the individual has a choice in terms of whether they, they want to disclose to their employer or not anything about their mental illness. And so what, what you see here is the implementation specialist is the person on our team who works with the agency. So again, the intermediary organization has an implementation specialist. We work with these programs in the community. And these are these give this this slide shows you the the activities that the implement, implementation specialist um, uh, does with the IPS worker um, uh, to teach them and help them to do a better job with this particular uh, aspect of individual placement and support. And and one thing I want you to see is that they are out in the field. Okay, there's modeling, and then there's actually going out into the community, working with, seeing how the um, IPS a staff member interacts with employers and participants. Um, I think I'm going to just skip this, and I'm, I want to just go to On Track New York, which is our early psychosis program. So, so this program is um, really began um, at the time that I arrived in New York State in 2012-2013. Um, we have teams. Um, across, and, we, and we've learned a lot from you guys in Canada uh, about how to do this. Um, uh, but here again, we have this centralized hub, which we call OnTrack Central, which is our um, part of our intermediary organization in supporting the, the dissemination of these teams across the state. We have 22 active teams. Um, we are, um, there are plans uh, over the course of this year to expand uh, to 29 teams. So we are growing. Um, and it, it's it's very challenging. It's very challenging. Um, okay, so um, again, we we purposely named ourselves something that didn't have mental health or psychosis in the name on Track New York. And you can see on uh, on this map uh, where we are in New York State uh, with a a, 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 a more uh, dense program, uh, number of programs downstate. Um, but you can see, and you can, and if you look at this map, you can see already that, you know, we're, we, we are in areas of population density. So, you know, what happens to people who don't live in those areas is, is something that, you know, is, is we're very, uh, uh, think a lot about and are, and are experimenting with different uh, strategies. And you can see here again, this is just over time, the number of sites 
Um, what this slide shows you, and again, the details are less important, but how we approach training uh, uh, initially. Um, so there's, uh, and, and again, over time, so an initial intensive training, uh, uh, building competency over two years. And these, again, we use learning collaboratives. We use co care consultation calls. We use learning management system and we use data and fidelity reports. These are the tools back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Um, and then, you know, once a team has developed its, um, you know, has, has good data, has, you know, really clearly uh, knows what they're doing, then, you know, we can back off. But then what happens? Someone leaves or three people leave. So it's this very um, sort of living, breathing entity, organism um, uh, that it, it, one has to, as the intermediary organization, has to adjust back and forth, up and down. OK, um, I, I, I uh, would the, this is this what this slide shows you is kind of what made this work as an intermediary organization? And I just, and again, this, this keep emphasizing, it's the connection with the state and government, the intermediary organization, and the agencies. So I just, the point here is that this, in order to make this work, the state had to um, always be, we had to always have access to the state leadership and they had to have access to us. A lot of dialogue connection to regional leadership, so not just state leadership, but regional leadership, and then our staff, and then data collection. We would not have gotten anywhere without each of these four things. Um, you know, we, we, we like to think we function as a learning healthcare system um, we, in which, you know, knowledge turns into um, uh, quality improvement, which turns into you know, changing practice and then data, then and data collection, which highlights things that we're doing well and then not well, which then turns into learning opportunities, which turns into quality improvement activities, et cetera. So this is this is just um, and 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 our the the NIMH's um, EpiNet Early Psychosis Intervention Network has really been sort of celebrating this notion of a learning healthcare system. And again, design, implement, evaluate, adjust and just in this circular way. And you can imagine that again, you need data, you need staff, and you need commitment um, to be able to sort of enact this. So just quickly going through on track New York, um, uh, through July 20, uh, 2022, we've had um, 2,761 uh, participants, very diverse group. Um, the state was committed from the beginning to um, uh, not, to, to, to removing economic barriers to receiving these services. Um, most folks live with families, 5% homeless, with a time since onset of psychosis of about seven and a half months. Um, what you see here is that um, we've had 9,700 9, individuals referred. Of those, 26% have actually gotten into the program. And the reasons that individuals haven't gotten into the program are, are range from just dropout, you know, falling out of the, 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 the pathway to um, not being eligible. And again, in, in our hands, you know, regrettably to some extent, 46% uh, of our individuals referred are referred from inpatient units, 24% from outpatient. And, and we really want to try to build um, an earlier point of referral before people end up in the hospital. Uh, this shows you our engagement rate. Um, so about 70% of individuals are still with us at 12 months, um, uh, which I, I would say, I would say discharge um, prior to 70, prior to a year, you know, would probably not be a favorable discharge. Um, uh, not, not so clear to me after a year, but you know, this is, this is, this is, this has been very um, uh, consistent. Um, here you can see the hospitalization rates every quarter. Percentage of individuals enrolled are in school. So we get people up, we get it about 70%. Uh, and um, I'm just going to um, show you a few more things that I think are kind of cool that illustrate the, um, the uh, learning healthcare system. So one of the things we, in our, for our EpiNet project, which was again this learning healthcare system study, we emphasized two things. One was 
in stakeholder input, and the second is data. And one of the things that we learn from really focusing on family council, participant council, provider council, a lot of qualitative interviews, was we learned that a lot of people had no idea what On Track New York really is. What is the program beyond sort of the four walls that they um, uh, see? And also, you know, that they realized that we realized that people didn't know what On Track New York was in the community. So we created an infographic. Um, that was really user participant driven. And, and again, this is available uh, on our website. Um, we, we wanted to learn about how our um, participants experience racism, um, both in the program and, and uh, in the community. And so we, we have been able to, to, to conduct a series of qualitative interviews um, that, that tried to learn what people had to share with us about this. I didn't see my race there. The social worker, the doctor, the interns, they didn't look like me. Um, and so we're using this now, this what we've learned to try to um, more appropriately address issues of racism within the program. Um, and uh, here is a, um, another participant driven um, uh, newsletter called Changing the Game. Dr. Dixon, we've just got one more minute. Okay, okay, so, um, and I'm, I'm gonna end just by um, showing you some data in terms of how we use Fidelity. Um, so you can see, th this shows you the flow of data, which I think you can imagine based on, um, on what I've already uh, shared with you. Um, but what you see here is uh, we have, one of our Fidelity items is at, for at least 50% of clients, at least one team member has had contact with a member of the client's family. And you can see here, this is this is presented by region that you know every all the programs have met this standard. Here is um, antipsychotic medications. At least one antipsychotic medication is prescribed for at least seventy five percent of clients. Now, one can disagree with these standards, but here again, you see that basically all the programs have achieved that standard. But um, uh, in terms of uh, enrollment in school and work. What you can see here is that that, that is not the case um, for all of the programs. Um, and so what this allows us to do is to sort of focus with the teams in a non-judgmental way on helping um, to support them in achieving um, these uh, standards. And, and again, we have to remember that things like work and school are affected very you know, um, substantially by social determinants of health which may vary across programs. So we're, you know, we, we keep that in mind as well. And what this slide shows you is the number of fidelity in, in, in doing fidelity assessments, the number of domains that haven't been met. And just, just FYI, you can see metabolic risk factors and, and getting labs is one that um, is a, 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 a domain that has not been met in, for many of our programs. And but then this gives us at OnTrack Central kind of the landscape of what we have to work on overall. So is scaling evidence-based practices a lost cause? I would argue, no, it can't be done. It can be done. Um, and you know, it's possible to work within the public mental health system to provide strategic technical support for implementation of EB EBPs. Distance learning can promote efficiency. It's difficult to establish the effectiveness of the EBP support, however, without dedicating resources to assessing training processes as well as fidelity and outcomes of treatment. We must rely on a range of data sources and designs to make inferences, self-report, administrative data, non-experimental. And again, we, we, we would not have learned what we learned about racism and how people experience that by just giving people a survey, um, we, we believe. I mean, we might now be able to do a survey, but we, we didn't, wouldn't, wouldn't have even known what to put in it uh, to, to get started. Um, and we're working toward maximizing inquiry and empirical approach to our activities. And I just want to end by thanking to uh, thanking my amazing team um, that many, 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 many people who contributed uh, and contribute to this work. So thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Dixon, for this excellent uh, presentation and for sharing your personal story of how this has shaped the work that you do um, to help bring research into practice. Um, and to help us provide the best possible care uh, and services for the patients and families that we serve. I'm honored now to turn it over to our distinguished Dr. Garfinkel 
who today's lecture has been named after to share a few remarks. Well, thank you. Um, this department uh, means a great deal to me. I've been part of it for 52 years. So I'm delighted to see this lecture. And I'm also pleased to recognize how the department has evolved over time. Most notably to me, there's an emphasis on standards that didn't exist 50 years ago. Regardless of how one's work contributes, quality counts. Also, there's real recognition that different evidence-based treatments can coexist. And the one that came to mind as Dr. Dixon was talking was about peer support, which um, encountered huge resistance when it was brought in. And now there's strong evidence as part of a treatment plan. Specific forms of therapy have made a huge contribution to our patients' care. Here I know particularly CBT, DBT in particular, but there's other work. Gary Roden's work um, on uh, psychotherapy for the terminally ill is very important. And outstanding work on housing by the late Paula Gehring is exemplary. Research in this department is vastly improved in quality and quantity. The uh, quality of our residents is vastly better. Greater sense of acceptance of our field by medical colleagues. There's also been some reduction in negative attitudes towards the mentally ill, but I feel this has been very, very modest for people with serious mental illness. We do have broad partnerships with communities, and these result in increasing knowledge and especially in fundraising. At the same time, there's a lot of noise about the need for a system of healthcare uh, in Canada, in mental health and throughout uh, health. Um, Dr. Dixon was very kind to um, Canadian healthcare in her introductory comments. We're woefully weak in having seriously ill people receive appropriate mental health care most people get no care at all or less than optimal treatment. After people leave the hospital, care is delayed, poorly integrated, or dropped entirely, as Paul's, uh, Paul Kurdiak's work has shown. A big problem for me is accountability is minimal. As Dr. Dim Dixon emphasized, who has ultimate responsibility matters. I like that everything is assessed in uh, the New York system. What I'd like to see more is clarity about goals. Is symptom relief what we're after or recovery? And what does recovery mean? Does it mean a life with a job, as we've heard, with a house, as Paula Gehring has emphasized, with friends or family or a sense of meaning? We can learn so much from others, and Dr. Dixon's work is exemplary, as is work from Europe, in, including from Trieste. Dr. Dixon's own work on, on track has a, a number of ingredients, about a half a dozen ingredients, that all have evidence base and make a difference to the lives of our patients. But we know, we know that most people don't get this kind of care. Now, this wouldn't happen if it was an adolescent with a malignancy or type one diabetes. Th 35 years ago, one of my sons developed diabetes mellitus and automatically in treatment, he saw a nurse educator, a dietitian. there was support for activity, family support and education, and an endocrinologist. We didn't have to go scrounging for that. I'll leave it to you to decide how much and in what ways members of this department can contribute to specific solutions to these pressing problems. Overall, the department has made much progress. I hope to see more of it. I extend my gratitude and my thanks to all of you. And thank you again, Dr. Dixon.
Thank you so much, Dr. Garfinkel, for your reflections, your lovely reflections. We're grateful for your longstanding contributions to our department. Unfortunately, we just have a minute for the Q&A, but I do see one question in the Q&A box, and I'll give you a chance to answer this, and then we'll close uh, our grand rounds. So Dr. Dixon, are there some fidelity items related to what not to do as opposed to what to do? Could you comment on this? That's such an interesting question. I love that question. Um, and um, it, it, I, but in my experience, um, what not to do is less helpful than what to do. Um, and um, so, you know, if you look at, I mean, take, take, take IPS, take supported employment. You know, there one of the you know the key operating principles is there's um, nobody is um, you're not allowed to 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 uh, reject someone if someone wants the service you know they that that's all it takes okay um, so so there's no exclusions to uh, to receiving the service so I think that I mean there's an example of where it's a very specific um, criterion that really speaks more to, to something positive than negative, right? Um, but I, I, you know, so, and there, there are probably a handful of examples of sort of what not to do, but it, it I, I would say, I would challenge all of us who are creating, um, uh, uh, trying to create and, and, and disseminate and, and research evidence-based interventions that I, I think it's um, it's our challenge to help people figure out um, you know not not what's forbidden but what's um, what's helpful mm -hmm. thank you so much for your comments and for your compelling presentation at today describing the role of organizations in scaling evidence-based practices and thank you to all our attendees for joining us today we look forward to seeing you all at our next citywide grand rounds on friday october 28th where um, we'll be covering the topic integrated biological and psychological approaches to ocd uh, enjoy the rest of your day everyone.